want to focus our attention this morning in Mark chapter 1, beginning in verse 21, and we'll read through verse 30, or excuse me, yes, through verse 31. And I'm reading from the New King James Version, um, but I encourage you with whatever version you might have in front of you to please follow along as we read together the Word of God. And again, that is Mark chapter 1. I'll give us a bit of time to turn there. And we will read from verse 21 through verse 31. Let us read the word of God together. Mark chapter 1, beginning in verse 21. Then they, that is uh, Jesus and his disciples, they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Now, there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, And he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. Then they were all amazed. So that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And immediately his fame spread throughout all the region around Galilee. Now as soon as they had come out of the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. But Simon's wife's mother lay sick with a fever. And they told him about her at once. So he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. And immediately the fever left her and she served them. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word. And please join me as we go to the Lord in prayer and seek his blessing uh, on our time in his word. Let's pray together. Our Father, as we come again this morning to your holy word, we confess our utter need of you. We confess, Father, that because of the corruption that remains in us, even as your children, we often do not realize just how much we need your Holy Spirit to minister in our hearts and in our lives, how much we need your Spirit to work that which is pleasing in your sight. Father, we pray that you would keep us from having such an arrogant attitude, and that we would come to your word humble, that we would come to your word seeking your blessing, and praying that your spirit would uh, use the word in each and every one of our hearts and apply it and write it upon our hearts. We ask our Father for any in our midst who don't know Christ, who are not Christians, who don't know what it is to trust Christ. We ask our Father that you would do that work which only your spirit can do, and that you would grant them to repent of their sins and to come and bow humbly before the King of Kings for salvation from sin. Our Father, we pray that you would draw near to us this morning. We pray that you would help us in your word and that we would even get a glimpse of something of the authority of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and that we too, just as this audience did, would stand in wonder that we would stand in awe and recognize that this is authority like no one else on earth has. We pray, Father, that we would give him glory and that we would give him the glory of our hearts as we worship him. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Authority is something that all of us are very familiar with. Our world is filled by God's design with structures of authority Uh, and submission to that authority. Uh, Parents are familiar with this, that God has given us a certain authority over our children. Employers have a certain authority over their employees. The civil government possesses an authority over its citizens. But another thing that we are just as familiar with is the limitations of our own authority. None of us in this room possesses absolute authority authority in any area 
or all areas of life. One of the reasons I asked Gary this morning to read from Luke's gospel, and I think as I looked at my notes, I announced it wrong. Hopefully you turned to the right place when he announced it right. It was Luke chapter 7, not Luke chapter 1. Um, but one of the reasons I asked Gary to read from Luke 7 uh, for us is because the centurion in that account vividly demonstrates this reality of understanding authority and yet understanding very vividly the limitations of our authority. Uh, the centurion, if you're unfamiliar, was a position in the Roman military at that point, and it was a position of s- uh, significant prestige, significant power, and he would have been set in charge over 80 soldiers under him. He was a man invested with great authority, and he was able, as he says, to issue commands to his men, and they must obey him. And yet this centurion limited, or, or recognized the limited nature, didn't he? of his authority. Uh, He knew that his authority applied to only one area of life. Uh, This powerful man had a servant, we're told, and apparently a servant who was very dear to him, who was afflicted with a severe illness. And this centurion, no doubt, would have been a man of of great means. He would have been a wealthy man, probably would have had the the greatest uh, advancements of medicine available to him at that day at his fingertips, but he simply did not possess authority to heal his servant. But he had heard of one who did have that authority, Jesus of Nazareth. And I always find it amazing as I read that passage how humble the centurion is and how full of faith he is. As he says to our Lord, Lord, don't, I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof. Simply say the word and my servant will be healed. And he says, I too am a man put under authority, and I say to one soldier, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, I say, do this, and he does it. You know what the centurion was telling Jesus and confessing to Jesus? He was telling Jesus, just as I give commands to my men, and they must obey me, I believe that you, Jesus, have that authority in an absolute sense over every area of life, not just over 80 men, but over all creation. And that's precisely what our Lord is demonstrating in our passage this morning in Mark chapter 1. Just a cursory reading, hopefully you have uh, your Bible open to Mark chapter 1. Just a cursory reading of these 11 verses reveals that Mark's burden here is to show us the unrivaled authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. The word is repeated twice by his audience, once in verse 22 uh, at his teaching, his authoritative teaching, and again in verse 27, the authority he had over demons. Uh, Mark wants to show us that Jesus of Nazareth, as Gary said, is no ordinary man, but he over everything in heaven and earth, whether it is visible or invisible, he possesses all authority. And our section this morning Uh, records one very busy and one very eventful Sabbath in the ministry and the life of our Lord. Uh, These 11 verses, everything that we read that took place, happened in one Sabbath uh, for the Lord Jesus. And in a single day, this town of Capernaum is introduced to Jesus, his authority in three different ways. First of all, if you're taking notes, this is my, uh, my outline, and I'll repeat these again as we go through them. But I just want to open up three distinct ways Mark shows us Jesus' authority. And the first of them is that Mark shows us Jesus' authority to teach us who God is. Secondly, Mark teaches us Jesus' authority over Satan and demons. And thirdly, Mark shows us Jesus' authority even over life and death itself. And so this morning, I just want to briefly open up each of these three subjects. Let us consider together, first of all, Jesus' authority to teach us who God is. Now look, at me with, uh, look with me at verses 21 and 22. It says, And they, that is Jesus and his disciples, they went into Capernaum. Now Capernaum, we're going to see, becomes somewhat of a home base for Jesus' Galilean ministry And it says, and immediately, again, there's Mark's favorite word, immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. Now, this is a whole other sermon and something I would like to devote significant time to, but as we see it here, it's worth a passing consideration. 
where did Jesus find himself on the Sabbath? At this point, it was still Saturday. Jesus, our Lord, finds himself on the Sabbath gathered with God's people for corporate worship. He finds himself in the synagogue. That is where God's people would have gathered because that's what the Lord's Day is for. That's what it's been for since the beginning of creation. That's what it was in the Old Covenant. That's what it is in the New Covenant. It is a day to be set apart uniquely to God, to worship God and offer him the praises of our hearts. And our Lord Jesus makes this, he, he is our example, as even he makes this a priority in his life to attend worship with God's people. Uh, but Mark tells us that, aside over, Mark tells us that not only was Jesus in attendance here on the Sabbath, but he is teaching. Now, I hope if you're like me, you ask questions as you read your Bible and you think through these things. Uh, one of the first questions that pops into my mind when I read this is, how do you just walk into a synagogue and all of a sudden you're asked to teach the scriptures, right? As one preacher I heard say, we have rules against those kinds of things, right? Uh, by no means would we just ask some visitor who comes in on a Sunday and not know anything about them and say, hey, would you like to take the pulpit this morning and teach us from God's word? Uh, we would never do that. And so the question is asked, how, how exactly did Jesus get in a place uh, where he is asked to teach? And a little historical background helps us here. Uh, the Jewish synagogue, which was the local place of worship for the Jews, right? There's one temple in Jerusalem, many synagogues. Uh, it typically would have a leader who was appointed for beginning and ordering services. He typically would have been the man who would lead in prayer, but the teaching or comments, as they would put them, or put it, comments on the scripture would often be left open to laymen, especially to those who had a reputation for knowing the scriptures. Uh, that's why we see Paul, if you read through the book of Acts, the Apostle Paul uh, often in the book of Acts has opportunity to reason with the Jews about Jesus and to teach the Jews about Jesus in their own synagogues because it was a natural platform. It was a custom in that day to allow traveling teachers who had a reputation for knowing God's word to teach the people in that specific service. And so Jesus avails himself of the opportunity. And he takes up this opportunity. And in fact, Luke tells us that he made it his custom to do this. Uh, and Mark, if you look, brief as Mark usually is, as, as we've seen already, he doesn't give us the details of what exactly Jesus preached on. Although we can assume that he expounded upon what we see in verse 14, that he was teaching them about the kingdom of God, the gospel, the need for repentance from sin, salvation from judgment. But rather what Mark zeroes in on here is the incredible effect Jesus' preaching has on his hearers. Look at verse 22. It says, they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. Uh, Matthew records for us at the end of the Sermon on the Mount the same exact reaction from the crowds that they've stood in awe because he taught them as one who had authority. And if this sermon was anything like the Sermon on the Mount, it's no wonder why they stood in wonder. There hasn't been better preaching. There hasn't been more serious and straightforward preaching uh, than that which came from the mouth of our Lord Jesus. Uh, literally, the language that Mark employs here, in the original language, it, it, it gives the sense that they were astounded or they were even dumbfounded by his preaching. Uh, it evoked a sense of awe and wonder that something, has, something is different about this preaching. Uh, I remember reading a testimony of a man who was a member in Martin Lloyd-Jones' church in London. And this man gave a testimony that for 15 minutes, that's a long time, for 15 minutes after Lloyd-Jones closed in prayer and walked off the stage, no one moved a muscle. No one spoke a word. Such was the power of Martin Lloyd-Jones's preaching. Uh, the, such was the evident anointing of the Spirit upon the preaching of Martin Lloyd-Jones. Behold, something far greater than Martin Lloyd-Jones preached this day. Someone far greater than even the greatest preachers we have ever heard was preaching in this synagogue on this Sabbath. What is it that as astonished this crowd? I think Mark gives us two answers to that question. He, he said he, he lists two things here. 
First of all, notice that they make a contrast between Jesus' preaching and the preaching that they were used to from the scribes in verse 22. Uh, the scribes, they were the teachers of the law. They had become the prevailing teachers in, in Jesus' day. They were the scholars, if you will, of God's word. And over centuries of tradition, the scribes' preaching had degenerated more and more into dry, empty discourses. And you know what? We're not actually left guessing as to what differences there may have been between the scribes' preaching and Jesus' preaching because we have on the pages of the New Testament in the four Gospels, Jesus constantly criticizing the scribes and constantly criticizing their handling of the Scriptures. And we could enumerate more than this, but I thought it would be good to consider just three things briefly, three key differences between Christ's preaching and the preaching of the scribes. Three things. First of all, uh, what Jesus taught, <coughs> excuse me, water went down the wrong pipe. First of all, what Jesus taught was true. What Jesus spoke was true. He rightly interpreted and handled the word and applied it to his hearers. And more than that, not only did Jesus teach the truth, but the way he presented the truth was open and straightforward. Uh, Jesus' sermons were not full of sleight of hand. They weren't full of evasion and exegetical tricks to find things that were never meant to be found in the scriptures. The scribes' teaching was full of that. Uh, it was full of evasive preaching, uh, uh, evasive reasoning to protect their own traditions, uh, to excuse their own immorality, uh, even at the expense of nullifying the truth of God's word. And that's why we see the Lord Jesus over and over in his ministry poking holes at their exegesis, and he's, he's pointing out contradictions of how they taught the word of God. Uh, he even made a whole point in his Sermon on the Mount dedicated to correcting things that they had heard taught, but that he was now going to give the right interpretation of. That's the first very important difference is Jesus' preaching was true. He taught the truth of the Word of God. The second thing, the second difference, is that Jesus preached on matters of weighty significance. He preached on matters of weighty significance. Uh, just like John the Baptist before him, right? And we spent a bit of time looking at John the Baptist preaching in his ministry. You study Jesus' preaching. Study the focus of his preaching, and he focuses over and over on what is important. Now, that's not to say that he doesn't come down and deal with the minor points of doctrine, the minor points of life. He does do that. But he always keeps it within the framework and the bigger picture of what is important the necessity of personal faith in himself, the necessity of personal repentance from sin, uh, the realities of the judgment of God, heaven and hell, the devil, holiness. These are the things that, that filled Christ's sermons. Uh, what did the scribes focus on? Literally, these are examples from the New Testament. They focused on how much dill and cumin they needed to tithe in order to not be a lawbreaker. They focused on how many steps they could take on a Sabbath and not be a Sabbath breaker. In Jesus' own words, they neglected the weightier matters of the law, which they shouldn't have neglected, and they focused on the lighter matters of the law. They focused on things that are trivial, and that is what filled their preaching. Jesus comes out, and he preaches, this is the big picture these are, what, these are the majors that need to be majored on. These are the things that need to be proclaimed front and center over and over to the people of God. And then thirdly, Jesus preached as one who lived what he preached. That is something that is massively important in the pulpit. There is no substitute in the pulpit for a good conscience. That I am living a life of sincerity before God that is in line with what I am declaring. The scribes were a bunch of hypocrites, the worst of hypocrites, wanting to put on such a show that they were so good and so squeaky clean on the outside and their actual lives were filled with immorality, filled with deceit and deception. Christ comes and he is the Holy One of God. He is the only man who perfectly lived what he preached. 
That is why his preaching was filled with authority and power. That's why it was owned by the Spirit. And that's why the scribes' preaching was not owned by the Spirit and had no power. Brothers and sisters, as I thought about these uh, three things, three differences between Christ's preaching and the scribes' preaching, one of the things that struck me is that I don't ever want to be a preacher that preaches like the scribes. Brothers, those of you who do some preaching or desire to do some preaching, don't ever preach like a scribe. Waxing long on little substance, citing this man made authority and this man made authority, talking forever about nothing of importance, that is not what the pulpit is for. The pulpit is for the straightforward, clear, unambiguous declaration of eternal truth. That's what the pulpit is for. It is for speaking plainly about plain things. Like one preacher said, it's about preaching as a dying man to dying souls. Because that's really what it is. It is really a confrontation with God himself in his word. Give me the guy, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, give me the guy who's a little rough around the edges. (laughs) The guy who, I don't care if your third point in your sermon didn't transition just as smooth as butter from your second point. That's really indifferent to me. Give me a guy who genuinely declares the truth, plainly, opens it up, applies it. You'll have done your job, and the people of God will have been fed. That's what preaching is about. None of this scribe business of majoring on minors, never getting around to the real issues of life. That's the first thing that Mark shows us that they, they point, or he points out a difference and a contrast between Christ's preaching and the scribe's preaching. But they also draw attention in verse 22, if you look, to Jesus's authority. They say that he speaks as one who has authority. Uh, one of my seminary professors would often say, it was one of his favorite phrases, he, he would say, Jesus does what he does because he is who he is. And I think that is exactly right, and I think that is exactly what holds true here. That Jesus' preaching had a peculiar authority because of who it is who is speaking. This is no ordinary rabbi traveling and coming into the synagogue. This is God in the flesh. I think that's what Gary said in his comments. This is the Son of God, God in the flesh, who, according to John 3, possesses the Spirit of God without measure. Imagine that. We can't even comprehend what that means. Jesus possessed the infinite, eternal Spirit of God without measure. What an amazing thing. I'm convinced that the authoritative nature of Christ's preaching is not simply because of his style of preaching, Uh, It wasn't just like he learned the art of preaching better than everyone else learned it, but foundational to his authority was who it was who was speaking to them. Uh, This is no longer a prophet simply saying to the people, thus says the Lord. Uh, This is now the word of God incarnate who can say truly, truly, I say to you. Have you ever thought about that massive shift in the ministry of the prophets and then the ministry of Jesus. All of the other prophets say, thus says the Lord. It's an indirect, if you will, message. Jesus comes on the scene, and over and over, his favorite phrase is, truly, truly, I say to you. Meaning it's on my own authority that I declare these things to you. He is the word of God incarnate, and that's why he has unique authority, brothers and sisters, to declare to us who God is and to teach us who God is. Isn't that amazing? If you want to know, brothers and sisters, what God is like, what he, what, who he is, look at the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's exactly what Hebrews chapter 1 says. Yeah, I would encourage you this week, read Hebrews chapter 1 and study the first paragraph. Just listen to verses 1 and 2. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. And then he's going to contrast. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he created the world. He, speaking of Christ, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. 
you want a Christology, study Hebrews. Study Hebrews chapter 1. You can't get, maybe, maybe John 1, but Hebrews 1 and John 1, you can't get a higher and more glorious Christology and a doctrine of who Christ is. I hope, Christians, we don't let some of these uh, common truths of the Christian faith lose their shock value. I know I struggle. That happens in my heart where I become acquainted with these, in such, these things in such a way that they can become common. And they don't, uh, we don't stand in awe like these audi- this audience stood in awe. But you know, if a Muslim were to hear what I'm saying to you, he would say Hebrews 1 and John 1 is blasphemy. And it would be blasphemy if it weren't true. But it is true. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. He has fully and finally declared God to us, and that is the foundation of all of our Christianity. He has come down in the flesh to teach us with authority who God is and what he is like. That's the first thing I want us to see is the authority, or that Jesus has the authority to teach us about who God is. The second thing I want us to see this morning, if you're taking notes, the second point on our outline is that Jesus has authority over Satan and demons. And we see that in verses 23 through 28. Jesus has authority over Satan and demons. Well, if you look at it, while most people stood astonished in this crowd at Jesus' teaching, there was one present in that synagogue that day who had quite a different reaction. Look at verse 23. It says, Now there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit. And don't, don't glance over those words, in the synagogue. <laughs> this would make for a very eventful church service, wouldn't it? Uh, that there is a man in the synagogue with an unclean spirit. Now, unclean spirit is a, is a description and a phrase we see often in the New Testament to describe fallen angels. Also, they go by the name demons. Uh, the devil is their ringleader, and they are called unclean because they are impure. They are sinful, they are wicked, they are utterly opposed to the Spirit of God, and their desire more than anything else is to corrupt, and it is to corrupt men in particular. And brothers and sisters, we need to make no mistake about it. These demons, these unclean spirits, had great authority given to them by the sovereignty of God to sway and to blind men and women. Uh, even to possess them and to begin to take over their faculties, as we see here in this account. Literally, uh, those of you who know Greek, you can look into this. Literally, the Greek, you could translate it, there was a man who was in an unclean spirit. Uh, And it's almost as if to say he was entrapped by this spirit. He was uh, engulfed by its power. He was engulfed by its influence. Uh, You know, Brothers and sisters, I think that we live in such an age of naturalism, right? The, the leading worldview of our day is naturalism, meaning that whatever you cannot scientifically prove, whatever you cannot see with your eyes, touch with your hands, uh, whatever you cannot taste and experience by the senses, you should not believe. That, that is the prevailing worldview of our culture. And I think, brothers and sisters, that that is so prevalent in our society that the church has bought into it somewhat. Uh, I think that two of the most common errors we see in the church today regarding the reality of Satan and demons is either on the one side we just downplay it as though it doesn't exist, there's not really a whole other invisible realm, or we swing way to the other side and everything just becomes the devil and everything is the demon and the, you know, the devil's in the doorknob, he's in the carpet, and we need to get him out. We don't want to go to that extreme either. Uh, don't get your theology from science, and also don't get your theology from the exorcist, right? We want to get our theology of Satan and demons from the Bible itself. And we need to understand this. The Bible presents us with a supernatural worldview. There is a real personal devil, and he really is roaming this world somewhere right now. And all of his legions of demons exist to do his bidding. And they hate more than anything God. They hate more than anything who Christ is. They hate more than anything the redemption of sinners and the gospel. You know, that's why if you look, the demon cries out, what do we have to do with one another? Literally, you could translate it, what do we have in common 
That's what the demon is, is asking Christ. And the answer to that is nothing. They had nothing in common. The devil and the Holy One of God are rulers of two very different kingdoms. And those kingdoms cannot live at peace with one another. And, you know, I think that that's how we're primarily meant to understand these confrontations in the Gospels. And we're going to see four of them in Mark's Gospel, possession uh, by a, a, an impure spirit. These are not just little perks that Mark thought would be good to throw in to kind of give a supernatural flavor to his gospel. We're supposed to see, when we see these confrontations between uh, demons and Christ, we are to see it as a clash of kingdoms, a clash of kingdoms, and it's Jesus showing that his kingdom wins. Notice that's why we see uh, the demons speak in the plural in verse 24. He says, let us alone. What do we have to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? It's as if the whole kingdom of Satan were coming and clashing against the kingdom of God, and in particular, the king of the kingdom of God, Christ himself. You know, brothers and sisters, there's something shown us here in this text, um, which granted, I don't think this was Mark's main purpose, but I think that it's worth consideration for us briefly nonetheless. And there's something in here that's a warning to us, and that is this, the uselessness of mere intellectual knowledge of Christ. The uselessness of mere intellectual knowledge of Christ. Have you ever thought about that? That the demons know their theology? And the demons know their theology very, very well. <laughs> Look at uh, verse 24. They know that Jesus has come to destroy them. They know that he is the Holy One of God, but none of them will be saved by that knowledge. And none of us will be saved by the, by the same merely intellectual knowledge of who Christ is. James 2.19, he says, You believe that there is one God, and you do well. Even the demons believe, and they shudder. Lloyd-Jones, I guess this was my week of Lloyd-Jones. I don't normally have a lot from him, uh, but I saw a quote this week, which I thought it just hits this right on the head. Lloyd-Jones told his, he, he said, uh, I tell, no, what did he say? He said, I spend half my time telling my people to study doctrine, and I spend the other half of my time telling them that doctrine is not enough. Isn't that exactly right? Half of his time is study doctrine, know who Christ is, know who God is, know what saving faith is, but the other half of his time, that's not enough. You actually have to possess it. It's not just about the brain, it's actually about a heart faith. It's about a humility towards Christ. Brothers and sisters, mere intellectual doctrine saves no one. True union with Christ through faith saves. You cannot have Christ apart from doctrine but you can have doctrine and not have Christ. That's the case for the demons. They know that Jesus is the Holy One sent down from heaven. They know that he died as a substitute for sinners. There's no question about that. They know that he drank death's cup, the judgment of God to the very dregs. They know that he raised from the dead and that he is right now at God's right hand. And none of that will save them. Because we must not only have that knowledge, brothers and sisters, but we must actually rest in that knowledge. As Luther famously put it, the Christian life consists in possessive pronouns. There's a world of difference between being able to say Christ is a Savior and being able to say Christ is my Savior. That is what we must all pursue, brothers and sisters. None of us must stop at the point of merely having the same knowledge that demons have. We must actually trust in the knowledge of who Christ is and what he's done. Well, returning to verse 25, aside over, look at verse 25. The devil and his demons are no match for Christ's authority. Verse 25 says, but Jesus rebuked him, saying, be quiet, come out of him. And notice what Jesus doesn't do here. I think it's very important and it's on purpose. He doesn't start to do any weird ritual. He doesn't employ any props. 
He doesn't recite any uh, uh, incantations of magic. And you know why he doesn't do anything, anything like that? Because he wants to show that he doesn't need those things. You know, sometimes, as we see Christ's miracles carried out in the Gospels, he does employ means. Like when he, he tells blind men to go and wash, and they receive their sight. But often we see him do what he does here, and he doesn't employ means simply to show he doesn't need anything besides his own authority. He doesn't need anything besides his very word. Just like he didn't need anything in Genesis 1 but his very word. Right? Genesis 1, he proclaims, let there be light, and what happens? There's light. Because that's the only choice light has, was to obey the word of its sovereign. Uh, that is what Christ is showing us here. He, according to Hebrews, again, study Hebrews 1, he upholds the universe by the word of his power. I think he can move demons around. I think he can command one demon to go from here to another place. You know, brothers and sisters, this is what we're going to be confronted with over and over in Mark's gospel, Jesus' infinite authority. Listen to Paul in Colossians 1, verse 16. Paul says, for by him, and that's a reference to Christ, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. If you can think of any other categories that Paul didn't think of, you, you can tell me. I can't think of anything besides heaven and earth, visible and invisible, thrones, principalities, authorities, powers. This demon had no choice but to obey his Lord, to obey his sovereign. As much as he hated it, as much as he was reluctant to obey, he had to obey the voice of Christ. Verse 26, uh, for the last time, he convulsed this man, he used his vocal cords one final time, and he came out. In the words of Martin Luther, the devil, though we have a long leash, is God's devil. That's what we must understand here. And the audience, again, is in shock, and rightly so, right? Uh, they're in shock. Verse 27, they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, what is this? What new teaching is this? For with authority he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. In other words, the same power that they had just heard proclaimed in his preaching, they now see demonstrated in his authority over Satan and demons. And verse 28, within no time, as you would expect, his fame spreads around the whole region. That's the second thing I want us to see this morning. And thirdly, as we close with our final point, the third realm of authority Mark wants us to understand is that Jesus has authority over sickness. He has authority over sickness. Briefly consider with me the final scene of this very eventful Sabbath in verse 29. Again, Mark employs his favorite word uh, immediately. It doesn't come through in the New King James. It's as soon as, as soon as they had come out of the synagogue, and it, you can almost lose your breath sometimes in the Gospel of Mark because it's just he's immediately doing this and immediately going here. Uh, but immediately he comes out of the synagogue, and they, that is Jesus and his disciples, entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now, Peter lived in this town of Capernaum. That's what we learn here. I think that's probably one of the main reasons uh, Jesus used it uh, as a home base, as it were, for his Galilean ministry. Uh, and upon arriving at Peter's house, apparently Andrew lived with him, uh, they find Peter's mother-in-law sick with a fever, okay? And just another aside here, uh, something that we see clearly, and this is another sermon, just like my Sabbath comment, Peter was clearly married here. That might seem like a to many of us, a pointless thing to point out, uh, and it would be, except that Roman Catholicism has taught, continues to teach, that celibacy was and is the way that is to be uh, pursued by any of Christ's ministers. Uh, but we see very clearly in this section that Peter was married. He had a wife, and he had a mother-in-law, uh, and we're shown here that there's nothing unfitting for Christ's pastors for his deacons to be married, and that it's actually proper and good and probably to be the norm, uh, very contrary to Roman Catholic teaching. Uh, but aside over again, 
Look at verse 30 with me. Uh, Verse 30 tells us that Peter's mother-in-law was sick with a fever. Now Luke, in his account, and remember Luke was uh, a physician, he was a doctor, and he took peculiar notice of details. That's one of the things uh, that Luke is very well known for, is he was meticulous in what he recorded, just as doctors are. Uh, But he says that in, in his account, he says that she was in the grips of a high fever. And that helps us to really paint the picture of what was going on here. This was not just a case of the sniffles, okay? This was not just a minor cold going on. Uh, This was a debilitating uh, illness. This was very serious, so much so that verse 30, she's lying down. And so it becomes very apparent that Peter's mother-in-law had something very seriously wrong with her and possibly was even on the brink of death itself. And so what do they do? I wonder, what would you do (laughs) if you had just seen and witnessed the events of this day? What would be your first thought as you see Peter's mother-in-law lying down very sick? I think you would tell the one that you just saw cast out the demon. (laughs) I think you would go to the one that you just heard teach in such a way that you have never heard taught. And that's exactly what these disciples do. And I think they're showing great faith here. Uh, They're showing great faith just like the centurion from Luke chapter 7 showed great faith because they're connecting the dots. If this one can teach as he teaches, if this one can command the demons, the unclean spirits, and even they must obey him, is not a fever something as well that he controls? Is this not also a realm of nature that the Lord Jesus can command and it must obey and so verse 30, that's exactly what they do. They tell him about her at, or tell him about her at once. And then verse 31, so he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up imme- and immediately the fever left her. And Luke actually adds the details that Jesus rebukes the fever. Again, emphasizing the power of his word to command uh, even a severe fever uh, and it has no choice but to obey its Lord and come out. But Mark includes two details here that I think are very intentional, things that we're supposed to take notice of here. Two things. Number one, the fever obeyed immediately. Okay? It obeyed immediately. There is no mystery here. (laughs) There is no ambiguity as to whether it was a result of what Jesus did that healed this woman. And by the way, that's what gets me. I hope it gets you too about all of these so-called TV evangelists who claim that they can uh, cure all sorts of cancer, they can immediately cure the lame. My biggest question to them is, if you can do those things, why aren't you at the hospital? Why aren't you at places where you can actually do these things and make all of people, all people's problems just go away? And the reality is they hide and shroud themselves in ambiguity because they can't do it. That is not what Jesus does here. There is no ambiguity here like, well, in three days, the fever went away. And was that the work of Jesus? Maybe, but maybe it was just natural causes. There's, there's nothing like that. The moment that Jesus spoke, immediately, the fever left. That's the first thing we're supposed to see. And secondly, the fever, not only did it obey immediately, it obeyed completely. It obeyed completely. End of verse 31, and she served them. <laughs> Peter's mother-in-law didn't say, I'm feeling a little bit better. Thank you, Jesus. Kind of you know, the thing that we say to our doctor when we don't want him to feel so bad that no- nothing that he's done has made a difference. That, that's not what Peter's mother-in-law sh- says. She didn't say, the fever is greatly reduced, but I need to sleep. I am not feeling myself. No, moments before this, she was laid up probably sweating, probably hot to the touch. And the moment Jesus helps her up and speaks a word, she's immediately better. She has life coursing through her veins, and she is feeling well enough to do the work of a busy hostess. And you moms and and women here know how much work that is to prepare for a crowd of people in your house. And it's probably the last thing you want to do when you've got a fever. But Jesus wants it to be known that his authority causes immediate obedience and it causes complete obedience. Brothers and sisters, this is the unrivaled authority of Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God. Everything is at his command. 
Just like the centurion said that this man, this Jesus, commands the demons, he commands fevers, he, as we will see later on, he will even command the stormy seas, and they will have no choice but to obey him and to bow down and do his bidding. Well, in closing, this all leaves us with an obvious question, doesn't it? An obvious question. Will we obey Jesus? Will we obey Jesus? Will we submit to his unrivaled authority? You know, I think we often think of authority merely in terms of brute force and the right to execute judgment. And Christ no doubt possesses that authority. And he will return in glory for a second time to save his people and to judge his enemies. And he will execute judgment and do justice upon the earth. But the glorious and the wonderful truth of the gospel, brothers and sisters and friend, if you're here and you're not a Christian, the truth of the the gospel is that Jesus not only has authority to judge, but he has authority to offer mercy. He has authority to offer grace and redemption. Jesus is demonstrating here in this passage that he alone has power to bestow salvation and redemption upon sinners. When we see him casting out demons and the power that he has over the realm of Satan, it should lift our eyes to the glorious reality that he has defeated the devil. He has silenced the accuser of the brethren who stands at the throne of God and points to the guilt of our sin. He has silenced the devil, defeated the devil by bearing the sins of his people in his own body upon the tree upon the cross of Calvary, so that his people can go free, so that they don't have to hang upon the tree. They don't have to endure God's judgment. When we see the Lord Jesus here bringing Peter's mother-in-law back to life, perfectly restored to health, it should lift our eyes to the glorious reality that Jesus is the great physician of the soul. All of us are born by nature into this world sin-sick, and desperately in need of a doctor. And Christ alone is able to make you spiritually well. And the, the hope and the promise that is held out to us in these verses is that he's able to do it immediately. He's able to do it completely. Christ doesn't do half work. He doesn't stop halfway through. But he has all authority in heaven and earth to save his people to the uttermost. That is what Christ offers you. He offers you himself in the gospel. The question is, will you submit to him? Will you repent of your sins and trust Christ? Will you believe in his authority to save your soul before the throne of God and to present you holy and blameless before a holy God? My prayer, my friend, if you're not a Christian, is that you would know that possessive pronoun, like Martin Luther said, that you would not just say Jesus is a Savior, but that you would be able to say with confidence, Jesus is my Savior. And that you would know what it is to be restored to God, pardoned for your sin, the power of sin broken in your life by the power of His Spirit dwelling within you, and one day the very presence of sin will be gone. And we will forever glorify Christ. And we will surround the one and give praises to the one who has all authority in heaven and on earth. May you trust Christ. May God grant you to come to him. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father, as we've sung this morning, even if we had a thousand tongues to sing, they would not be worthy to do justice to your glory. Lord Jesus, they would not be sufficient to declare your authority your wonder. And Father, I'm very aware this morning even of the feeble efforts of my own to open up the glory of Christ as you have recorded it in your word. And yet, Father, we trust that you use the proclamation of your truth to do your work and to build your church, both to sanctify her and wash her in the truth of the word and to add to her new members who bow the knee to Christ Father, we pray that you would do that work. We pray for your spirit to bless.
uh, your word opened up this morning to our hearts. And we pray, Father, that he would do what only he can do in each and every one of us. And we pray, Father, you'd bless our time now as we go across the way and have a time of fellowship together. We pray that you would sharpen us through our fellowship together. We pray that you would grant us to have Christian fellowship around Christ and around the gospel, and that your son would be exalted and lifted up even in our conversation. Father, we pray that you would bless us. We pray for Bethany, that you would grow us as a church to have more of an awe and a wonder at who you are and what you have done for us. We pray, Father, that you would help us, and we ask in Christ's name.